I'm just going to jump right in here to um, sort of an intro to a little bit more about what I do specifically at the Xerces Society to lay some groundwork and some context for the rest of the discussion. Um, but can I at least see a, a show of hands? How many of you have heard of the Xerces Society? Oh, my God. How did that happen? Um, if I had asked that three or four or five years ago, I imagine there would be far fewer hands raised. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are perhaps the oldest wildlife conservation organization in the United States that most people have never heard of. We are sort of the Autobahn Society of Insects, which a lot of people think is a weird thing. Uh, but if you consider the fact that the majority of all described living organisms on Earth are invertebrate animals, um, invertebrate animals vastly outnumber vertebrate animals, plants, fungi, and other described organisms combined. If you consider that, I guess it makes sense that there is some small, scrappy organization like ourselves out there working on these little creatures. Um, the Xerces Society takes our name from the now extinct Xerces blue butterfly. This is the first butterfly to go extinct in North America as a result of habitat loss, and it serves as sort of a symbol of our mission. Uh, we began actually as a butterfly conservation organization and then have evolved over time to work on other invertebrate taxa. We've got an aquatic invertebrate conservation program, which is doing some amazing work to conserve migratory dragonflies, dragonflies that actually follow the migration corridors of raptors um, from Canada to Mexico every year. Um, we've got an endangered species program working on um, imperiled and uh, at-risk invertebrate animals, things like freshwater mussels, perhaps the most single most imperiled group of living organisms on Earth. And then we've got our pollinator conservation program, the, the program that I co-direct. Um, the pollinator conservation program specifically works to conserve agriculturally important pollinators, meaning primarily native wild bees. And it's sort of a convenient framework for merging um, the, the disciplines of conservation and agriculture, I think. Um, sort of that um, cross-pollination of those two things that inspire most of us, whether we're in the conservation world or we are organic farmers. So that's a little bit about the Xerces Society. Um, you know, I won't, I won't dig into the um, sort of staff backgrounds, but everybody within the pollinator program at Xerces has sort of one foot in agriculture and one foot in conservation. It's an interesting cross-disciplinary program. All right, let's get into the meat of the subject here, um, the actual uh, ecology and life history of pollinators and how we can conserve them and why pollinator, why pollinator conservation specifically matters to um, farming and specifically organic seed production. So there are, of course, for most of you here, very tangible, pragmatic reasons for being interested in pollinators and conserving pollinators. Pollinators have a direct economic impact for, uh, for many seed producers, unless you're growing totally wind-pollinated crops. But as I will try to make the case today, even wind-pollinated crops have issues with insect pollinators that um, may or may not be helpful to you. Uh, pollinator conservation is also a convenient framework for meeting different biodiversity uh, food standard criteria, uh, even thinking about USDA organic and the definition of um, an organic farm in NOSB standards, biodiversity is one of the defining characteristics, biodiversity conservation. And we're finding more and more people who are interested in incorporating pollinators into their farm system primarily for that reason. They may not have bee-dependent crops, but they see this as sort of a, an easy way to support larger biodiversity goals. There are, of course, secondary benefits that come along with pollinator conservation. Many of the habitat systems that, that I will talk about um, today also benefit soil and water conservation. They can benefit pest control, and I'll dig into that. But 
Um, I hope that all of us also recognize that pollinator conservation is simply the right thing to do. Pollinators are, of course, in uh, pretty significant trouble. So it's also important to think about how pollinator management and pollinator conservation impact crop genetics and the integrity of um, especially organic seed crops. There are issues with the way pollinators interact in the landscape that may uh, be detrimental to us. They may, in, in some cases, um, lead to, they may, they may inadvertently cause undesirable outcrossing. Conversely, if you don't have enough pollinators for certain crops, you may be faced with inbreeding depression issues. Um, and of course, the big elephant in the room is the role of pollinators, especially with insect pollinated crops like canola and alfalfa, the role of pollinators in um, spreading GMO uh, contaminants into the seed stream, if you will. So there are different pollinator, pollen contamination pathways that, we'll, that we will dig into, but um, thinking about it here from the outset, um, I want you to keep in mind that pollen can be moved in seed systems through wind, it can be moved through bees, and it can be moved through beekeeping equipment, something that's largely unrecognized and underappreciated. So that's some basic kind of big picture background context here. Um, I also want you to hear from the outset, think about um, the broad categorical um, importance of pollinators beyond simply what's going on on individual farms. So globally, um, I think we say here something like more than 70% of plant species on earth, this, this number is actually outdated. Um, current research demonstrates that about 85% of all plant species on earth require some form of animal mediated pollination. Or, or the, the assistance of an animal to transfer pollen from um, one flower to another. There are different economic models that have been developed to demonstrate the importance of pollinators. We can say, for example, that 35 or 40% of global crop production is dependent on insects. We can put these different dollar values on, on the contribution of pollinators. That's all well and good. Um, from my perspective, that's sort of like trying to put a dollar value, however, on oxygen or on clean water. We don't have a direct substitute for the role of insect pollinators. So when we talk about pollinators, most of us initially think about this species, the, the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. This is the bee that most of us are familiar with. Many people are, are surprised to learn, even people that know a lot about bees are oftentimes surprised to learn that um, the honeybee is not native to North America. It was brought over from Europe in the early 1600s. It established very quickly across the United States and um, was very successful on this continent for a number of centuries. But now we know that the honeybee is experiencing significant challenges and from a food security standpoint alone, this puts us in a rather vulnerable position. And some context on that position that we currently find ourselves in. Since 1945 or 1950, we have had a roughly 50% decline in the number of managed honeybees in North America. There are multiple reasons why we're seeing these declines um, there are obvious disease issues, there are pesticide issues, there are parasite issues like the introduced varroa mite on the back of that bee, um, the varroa mite being a parasite of an Asian honeybee species. This, this parasite was accidentally introduced in the 1980s to North America and spread throughout the beekeeping industry. If you look at that mite, the scale of that mite on the back of the bee, that's like you or I having a deer tick the size of a dinner plate that's running around on us, not just sucking blood, mind you, but also vectoring viruses at the same time. There are also demographic factors at work with the decline of honeybee keeping in the United States. Um, when I was keeping honeybees commercially, I was always fascinated to go to the beekeeping supply company in my, my state um, every spring to pick up new frames and new boxes in the spring. 
when all the other beekeepers were coming out to get their supplies for the year. And it was interesting to see that the next youngest commercial beekeeper there was usually about 75 years old. Um, so for whatever reason, young people don't want to get into this business where you get stung a thousand times a, a day and you don't make a lot of money and you have to uproot your family from um, town to town as you follow different crop blooms across the country. Um, on top of these existing um, sort of challenges the, the U.S. beekeeping industry has been facing, in 2006, we experienced this amplification of bee losses, this phenomenon called colony collapse disorder that we um, think is probably a complex of different stress factors, different pesticide issues, loss of habitat, um, declines in pollen diversity that bees are bringing back to the hive. So honeybees are trucked from monoculture to monoculture to monoculture on a commercial scale. Um, and consequently, they're having a single pollen source or a single nectar source to feed upon for an extended period of time. Sort of like you or I eating um, nothing but broccoli for a month. Broccoli is good for us, but broccoli is broccoli alone probably will not sustain us. And that's been one of the challenges here. So in 2006, we had this really steep increase in honeybee losses called colony collapse disorder, where... Um, about 35 to 40% of U.S. hives just vanished. The worker bees vacated the hives. They flew off into crop fields and disappeared. Um, this has had a real-world economic impact on the U.S. ag industry. I promise you this is the most boring graph of the presentation, but if you bear with me here for a moment, I want you to, to get a sense of what this economic impact looks like. If you focus here just on the top bar of this graph, this represents the average cost to rent a single honeybee hive for almonds in California. There are 800,000, give or take, acres of almonds in California right now. Those almond orchards are stocked at a minimum rate of two honeybee hives per acre. There are almost two million honeybee hives, commercial honeybee hives in the United States. Um, if you do the math in your head, you quickly understand that most honeybee hives in America go to California every year, right now, in fact, to pollinate this one crop. Um, and you quickly understand that we're facing already a pollinator deficit. So 1995, almond producers are paying an average of $35 to $40 to rent a single honeybee hive. Uh, by 2005, as honeybee losses really increase exponentially, um, that that average cost doubles. Almond growers then go on to pay roughly $75 to $80 to rent a single honeybee hive for that two-week almond bloom period. 2006 comes along, colony collapse disorder hits really hard, 2007, 2008, and this is what happens to the average cost to rent a single honeybee hive. 2008, almond producers are paying an average of $200 per hive and flying in bees from as far away as Australia, packing bees into the luggage hold of 747 aircraft from Australia to make up the demand. Um, we thought for a while that this had sort of leveled off, but the past few years have been really, really, um, uh, they've continued to be really catastrophic for honeybees. So I also want to make the point that honeybee declines are only part of the story. Our native pollinators in many cases are also suffering. In some cases, their plights are significantly worse. Based upon new research um, over the past year and data analysis that's been done in 2013 and is continuing right now, we think, we're fairly confident in saying that 30% of U.S. bumblebee species, wild bumblebees, are at risk of extinction. Um, there are 50 to 55 bumblebee species that are native to North America. 30% of those are on the brink of extinction today. So you still see bumblebees out probably on your farm. Um, you may still see good numbers of them. The diversity, the range of species that you see has shrunk in a very, very significant way. Um, Franklin's bumblebee there in the upper right-hand corner, once native to Oregon and California, this bee has gone extinct in the past five or 10 years. 
Um, down Kitty Corner from it, the rusty patched bumblebee native to uh, New England and the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes region, that bee is teetering on the brink of extinction and may, may disappear from the earth um, this year. The western bumblebee in the lower right-hand corner, Bombus occidentalis, once the most common bumblebee west of the Mississippi River, is now absent from almost its entire range. Um, so these things are dropping off the map at a really alarming rate. There are multiple reasons why we're losing bumblebees, uh, pesticides, habitat loss, probably most significantly, um, and this is a, a area where you can play a direct role in protecting bumblebees. Probably the most significant driver uh, behind bumblebee extinctions is the spread of bee diseases into wild bumblebee populations from packaged, commercially available bumblebees that people use, um, especially for greenhouse tomato pollination and in some cases open field pollination of different crops. So with fewer bees available, oh, and I didn't even touch on monarch butterflies, but um, check out the news this week on monarch butterfly populations as well to get a global sense of what's going on with pollinators. Um, it's not good. Um, but with these declines taking place, it's important that we think about how we first and foremost diversify the range of pollinators that we depend upon for agricultural production. And I would argue that despite the declines we're seeing in native bees, or in bumblebees specifically, native bees largely can um, pick up the slack. Native bees can fill the, the role that honeybees are oftentimes asked to provide in production agriculture. We have an incredible diversity of native bees in North America, um, roughly 4,000 species, many of which are close associates of specific crops. And I'll give some examples of specific bees that are associates of specific seed crops here later. Um, these wild bees contribute billions of dollars a year to the U.S. economy, um, and it's important that we recognize them, and it's also important that we strengthen habitat for them and pesticide protection for them. So let's talk about what these specific groups of bees um, look like, what they behave like, a little bit about their ecology and life history and how they are functioning on your farm um, perhaps not today, but um, hopefully in a few months from now when, when the growing season kicks into gear. So thinking about seed, um, seed crop pollinating bees, we've got sort of four broad groups of bees that we can lump all of these thousands of different bee species into. You've got um, your non-native honeybees, which are a truly social organism. We've got our bumblebees, which despite their declines are still among the most agriculturally important pollinators that we have. We've got wood nesting solitary bees, we've got ground nesting solitary bees, and I'll talk about each of these groups in a little bit more detail. I'm probably not spending much time on this particular group because I think it's the one that most of you have a, a working or functional knowledge of. Um, the honeybee, of course, is this social animal with this division of labor inside the hive. You've got the, the reproductive egg-laying queen, you've got her worker daughters, you've got the male drones, which like, um, much like male humans, don't really contribute much to the bee, greater bee society. Um, they primarily drink nectar and seek out mates and are largely sort of parasites on, on their family unit. Um, <laughs> A honeybee is, of course, sort of a generalist pollinator, meaning that it visits many, many different types of crops. Being an old world pollinator, um, it has a particular affinity for certain old world crops. But thinking about many of like our vegetable crops, tomatoes, um, pumpkin, squash, uh, many of these are new world crops, and th those crops tend to have more effective on a bee for bee basis, um, wild pollinator associates. So I also want to talk about the, or just make a, a brief note of the, the foraging distance of honeybees. Honeybees are extremely far flying animals. Um, they will forage routinely four or five miles away from their hive to seek out productive 
pollen and nectar resources. They can fly farther than that, but after a certain point, there's a, a law of diminishing returns. They, you know, if you get much be much beyond five miles or so for a honeybee, you tend to expend more energy flying that distance than you're able to bring back to the hive. Um, but thinking about that distance, what that means is that a single honeybee hive is routinely pollinating um, sort of a 50 square mile area, a single honeybee hive. Think about what that means in terms of isolation distances for different crops. Um, now, those honeybees, as I said, we've, we've really sort of considered them to be the primary agricultural pollinator, They're the one that we're most familiar with, but they are not, for many, many crops, the most effective group. And we've got some great research that came out in the journal Science last year looking at um, more than 40 different crop systems. And this is an amazing research review article, more than 40 authors, some of the leading uh, pollination researchers from around the world looked at over 40 different crop systems and found that in, in crop systems where there was visitation by honeybees and wild bees, that honeybees only contributed really to the, the effective pollination or seed set in about 15, 14 or 15 percent of those crops. Whereas wild bees in almost all of the crop systems were directly contributing effectively to pollination. I'll give you, a, uh, I guess, a more tangible example of what this is describing, sort of the, the differences in native bee foraging and honeybee foraging that this is describing. So honeybees, for example, because they are a social unit, tend to segregate into pollen foragers or nectar foragers, most of them being nectar foragers. Um, if you've got uh, a workforce, a foraging workforce of 20,000 um, honeybees that are actively patrolling the landscape around them and bringing resources back to the hive, um, probably 75 or more percent of those bees are out collecting nectar. Using apples as an example, I realize this isn't a seed crop, but um, the same sort of... of effect is present in many different plant systems. Using apples as an example, look at this honeybee on the left. That is a nectar foraging honeybee. You can see that it has bypassed the anthers of the flower. It has no interest in collecting pollen from that flower. It may get some pollen um, dusted upon it. But look at the, the wild native digger bee on the right. It is up in the anthers. These wild bees, these solitary bees in particular, collect pollen on every single foraging trip. So on a bee for bee basis, they tend to be more effective pollinators. Um, and you, when you combine that, and I'll come around to this here later with um, the very short flight distance of these native bees, they, it tends to make them sort of the optimal seed crop pollinators. They're not going to expose you to a lot of off-farm pollen contamination, and they're going to do a very effective job on the flowers they visit. So moving away from honeybees here for a moment, let's, let's turn now to the bumblebees, which despite the, the challenges they're facing, as I mentioned, are probably um, our most agriculturally important group of pollinators, of bees anyway. Um, there are 45 to 55 species of, of these bumblebees in North America. These, like honeybees, are uh, a social insect, meaning they've got the caste system with a queen that's laying eggs, the worker daughters, and then, of course, the males that don't do all that much. Um, they're unlike honeybees. Bumblebees form annual colonies, meaning that they function sort of like an annual plant. They grow from a single queen each year to a full-grown colony, and then they die off at the end of the season, producing new queens, um, sort of the seed of the colony that hibernate individually and go on to found new colonies the next spring. Um, unlike honeybees, which are sort of like a perennial plant, something that without parasites or diseases or pesticide exposure can persist from year to year. Uh, most of your bumblebees are ground nesting species, nesting in old rodent burrows, nesting underneath grass tussocks, nesting in hay bales or um, little cavities in your barn where they can get into the insulation uh, 
Um, they are uh, probably important, I didn't mention this here, um, probably also important to keep in mind that bumblebees are highly effective cold weather pollinators. So bumblebees, unlike most other insect groups, are basically warm-blooded animals. They can raise their internal body temperature um, to roughly the same temperature as, as a mammal, as, as uh, roughly the same temperature uh, as a human. So if you go very north, very far north into cooler climates or wetter climates, you'll continue to see bumblebees out foraging, um, even under pretty inclement weather conditions. Bumblebees are also incredibly important pollinators of things like tomatoes, many solanaceous crops. They tend to be extremely important for um, forage seed production, for sunflowers, for cucurbits. They tend to have a very narrow um, foraging radius away from their hive, typically no more than a mile or so from their hive. So again, from a crop isolation distance management standpoint, um, they, they're slightly more optimal if off-farm uh, pollen contamination is a concern. Um, turning now to our solitary bees. So solitary bees are, just as the name would suggest, solitary individuals. Each female bee is her own queen. She's going out and finding her own nest site and laying her own eggs. She doesn't have uh, worker daughters. She doesn't have nest mates. Um, they may be gregarious. They may, in some cases, nest nearby each other. But the majority of bees on Earth are these solitary species that are simply out there operating um, on sort of their own time frame and their own agenda. And these solitary bees can be really, really small, sort of as small as a, a typical brown pavement ant to um, fairly large species that are almost an inch in length. These these native solitary bees tend to be incredibly important, but high, but but largely unrecognized or underappreciated crop pollinators. And I'll give you some examples of these. Um, before I do, I wanted to, to expand on sort of this life cycle of a solitary bee, however. And this, this um, pictograph here sort of represents a typical solitary bee life cycle where at the roughly the three o'clock position, most solitary bees um, are ground nesting species that will excavate an underground tunnel. They will provision that underground tunnel with a mass of pollen. They will lay a single egg on that pollen mass. That's, that's a single cell. Um, that egg will hatch at roughly the five or six o'clock position. The larvae that you can see there at about seven o'clock will feed on that pollen mass. The, the bee will then pupate late in the season and typically spend the winter underground as a fully formed but dormant solitary bee, only to emerge the following spring or summer as a free-flying individual. So most solitary bees um, spend most of their life in sort of this developmental phase and have a very short window of time when they're actually active as a flying adult. These solitary bees also tend to have very low reproductive rates. 50 offspring may be a, a large um, number of, of uh, sort of progeny of a single solitary bee. As I said, most solitary bees are ground nesting. There are roughly 20,000 species of bees on Earth. Um, probably 15,000 of those are ground nesting, um, excavating tunnels that can extend several feet underground. They line the walls of those tunnels with a waxy glandular secretion that in many species can resist flooding. You'll have species that actually excavate nests in vernal pools or seasonally wet areas, areas that are prone to flooding. Um, from above ground, unless you're actively looking for these, these bees, you may simply see these emergence holes from the ground or these nest holes in the ground that look like uh, a spot where a night crawler emerged or a worm um, emerged overnight. So a few sort of specific examples just to make this concept of a solitary bee and these solitary groups um, of bees a little bit more concrete. You've got solitary bee species like longhorned bees, uh, 
um, which as the name would suggest, have these sort of absurdly long antennae. Um, these tend to be very common in summer. There are specialist longhorn bees of Asteraceae, especially um, sunflowers. There are specialists of cucurbits. This bee in the upper right-hand corner there is particularly interesting to me. Um, just to geek out on you with, with some basic bee identification here for a moment, this bee is Bombus bimaculata, the black and white longhorn bee. It's a really interesting bee in that it visits corn tassels for pollen, among other things. Um, and thinking about that, it has a very close affinity to cucurbits, to corn, to beans, summer um, flowering beans. Think about where that bee sort of evolved in North America and the, the plant systems that it was associated with. It's very common in the Midwest um, to see this bee in gardens. I have no doubt that if you were to travel back in time and visit with buffalo bird woman or some Native American farmer in Cahokia, Illinois, um, you would have seen this bee in those farm systems. Um, aside from longhorn bees, we've got ground nesting sweat bees as another broad group of solitary bees. As the name suggests, these species are sometimes attracted to human perspiration. They're probably collecting the salts in your perspiration to um, provide micronutrients that their eggs need or that their ovaries need to mature to the point that they can, they can lay eggs. These bees tend to be very active in the summer and fall as well. Um, some of the more conspicuous ones are these metallic green colors. If you live basically anywhere in the continental mainland United States and are looking at a sunflower in late summer, um, you are no doubt very familiar with these metallic green sweat bees. Um, again, incredibly important seed crop pollinators and largely overlooked, largely underappreciated. Another group of ground nesting solitary bees that are having a, a very significant role in the production of many crops are ground nesting squash bees. This is an interesting example of a native North American bee group that has expanded its range. This is a, a bee that was probably historically limited to Central America and Mexico. Um, it actually nests at the base of squash plants. The, the males will spend the night inside the squash blossoms, drinking nectar and having these little bachelor parties, these little aggregations of male squash bees that you can come along oftentimes in the morning and find. The female bees come up and visit the squash blossoms very early in the morning, oftentimes before the blossom is fully open, before the sun has even risen. These bees nest right in the ground at the squash plant, and it's very common to run across squash and pumpkin farmers in the south, in the Midwest, in the southwest, and find people who are paying a lot of money to bring in honeybees for pollination. And those honeybees are active sort of midday after these blossoms have already been visited and pollinated by squash bees. Um, in fact, where you've got good soil um, conservation practices in most of the U.S., you probably have enough squash bees present to pollinate even large-scale commercial squash um, uh, fields. Uh, I think this is a final group of ground nesting solitary bees that I, I thought I'd point out. Um, alkali bees are something that I've got a particular affinity for having grown up in North Dakota with a lot of saline seeps on our land, land that was really good for nothing, um, perhaps other than raising these alkali bees. These are bees that nest in salt flats in playas, in, in those sort of crusted over soil surfaces that have a high moisture content um, below ground. These bees will nest down in that soil and they are incredibly important pollinators of alfalfa seed crops in the West as well as um, some carrot seed production and onion seed production. I'll talk a little bit about those crops specifically later. But we actually see, if you go up to, say, Walla Walla, Washington, you will see alfalfa seed producers who have intentionally created 
sort of artificial salt flats for these bees. And there's a raging controversy right now in eastern Washington around a highway expansion that threatens to run right through one of these major population um, hotspots for the alkali bee. And the, the farmers up there are really up in arms about what that traffic will do to their alkali bee population. So beyond the solitary ground nesting bees, there are, of course, solitary wood nesting bees, bees that nest in old beetle borer holes in trees, bees that nest in hollow plant stems. Um, there's, there are some of these species like mason bees, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, or, or leaf cutter bees that you can artificially manage for crop pollination. I will only highlight here the leaf cutter bees, these bees that are active in midsummer. Mason bees tend to be spring active animals and from a seed production standpoint, um, don't really come into the equation, at least for most vegetable crops. Um, but the leaf cutter bees tend to be summer active bees. These are bees that are out um, nesting in these hollow plant stems or these beetle bore holes or artificial nests of grooved boards fitted, fitted together to create cavities for them. Um, these bees are gathering pollen and bringing it back and laying an egg on that pollen mass, just like their ground nesting counterparts do. But they have this interesting habit of scissoring out perfectly round circles of leaves to wrap that pollen provision and their egg in, sort of like little origami packages stuffed inside of these nests. Um, one species, the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, an adventive species, a species uh, from Eurasia that somehow um, found its way here to North America, it has been particularly important for a lot of different crop, um, seed crop production. Does anybody here use alfalfa leaf cutter bees? Okay. Um, there are some compelling reasons to think about their role in even vegetable seed crop production, but I'll talk a little bit more about them as well. There are, of course, um, other important crop pollinators beyond bees. There are flies, especially surfid flies and tachinid flies that tend to be incredibly important for things like carrots or alliums. Um, some of these flies, in fact, most of these flies can provide some meaningful biological control. Um, they are oftentimes predatory during at least one life stage. There are, of course, solitary wasps that are incredibly important seed crop pollinators in some cases as well. Um, like the flies, those solitary wasps are typ typically providing some biological control. So they're providing you with both pollination and pest management. There are various other insects as well, including some crop pests that tend to be important pollinators. Cucumber beetles being sort of the classic example, or thrips, where they're doing damage to the plant, but also spreading pollen between flowers as well. Okay, digging now into sort of the heart of, of crop management for bees. Um, I wanted to continue the, the, this line of thinking around foraging distances of the bees and what that means in terms of crop isolation. I wanted to talk about some common pollen contamination pathways um, that are present uh, through bees and some thoughts on reducing that, that impact of uh, pollen contamination simply through manipulating um, habitat to the advantage or disadvantage of of pollinator groups. Um, as I, I covered earlier in some of the slides, you've got different foraging distances that these different pollinator groups are capable of uh, operating within. So honeybees, again, will routinely forage four or five miles away from their hive, meaning that they're covering sort of a 50 square mile uh, area and transferring pollen within that area. Your bumblebees are typically operating at more of the farm scale, meaning that they're flying not much more than a mile or even a half mile if resources are really, really plentiful from their hive. And then you've got your solitary bees, which are maybe flying up to a half mile, depending on the species. And very commonly, they may be foraging no more than several hundred feet from their nest. Um, so 
thinking about your particular crops and the landscape you're in and what your neighbors are doing, this may or may not be relevant to you. So I've alluded to this now multiple times, but beekeeping equipment is a potential pollen contamination pathway. There's some interesting research that demonstrates the, the viability of pollen inside honeybee hives. There are documented uh, uh, cases of honeybees, newly emerged honeybees, honeybees that just hatch out of the comb and are ready to go out and um, have maybe been working inside the hive as nurse bees for a few days and are ready to go out and forage. Those honeybees are oftentimes leaving the nest with just stray grains of pollen attached to their body that their sisters have been bringing in for weeks or months prior to um, that bee getting ready to go out and be a forager. So thinking about that, you know, if you are a, a brassica seed producer in Skagit Valley, Washington, and you're bringing in honeybees from a migratory beekeeping operation, a commercial beekeeper who's moving north up the West Coast, um, maybe had their bees down in uh, California's Central Valley pollinating some crops, probably out visiting some wild, weedy mustards, um, and then you bring that hive onto your farm, um, you have very little control over the pollen, the stray pollen grains that are inside that hive and what that may mean for um, your, your seed crop purity. Um, alfalfa leaf cutter bees, I won't talk about this um, very much since nobody's actively keeping them, but they can be um, valuable seed crop pollinators for things other than alfalfa. But like honeybees, uh, alfalfa leaf cutter bees, which are sold in as, as bulk cocoons and moved in nesting blocks from region to region across the border between Canada and the U.S. extensively, especially for alfalfa seed crop production and a few other things in the Treasure Valley of Idaho and um, the Peace River Valley of Canada. Um, these, these cocoons come dusted with a whole bunch of stray pollen grains. Um, this is the, the pathway that you will see um, long-term contamination of organic alfalfa seed sources into um, the United States coming from. So uh, there's really no controls right now over the transfer of alfalfa leafcutter bee cocoons between Roundup Ready alfalfa and other um, non-GMO uh, alfalfa seed crops. It's a very interesting situation. Um, so thinking about some ways to reduce pollen contamination, the simplest strategy is simply to is simply to um, manage for the smallest possible pollinator, and especially to manage for wild pollinators that are resident on your farm and that are going to stay within your, you know, your, co your comfortable crop isolation distances. Um, if you're getting in managed bees from a commercial source, you should um, inquire as to the source of those managed bees if you're concerned about the introduction of off-farm pollen. There are ways you can control the movement of pollinators on your farm and off of your farm as well by creating um, tall wind breaks to reduce foraging of bees outside of farm boundaries or creating um, large expansive grass buffers that um, don't have a lot of pollen, uh, pollinator attractive plants in them, that don't have a lot of wildflowers or, or flowering weeds in them. The bees will be less likely to venture across those if you've got adequate pollen and nectar resources on your farm. So um, thinking about some crop specific guidelines with alfalfa, there's um, interesting cases, well, an interesting case with the flower morphology where the stamens are held under the keel petals of the flower. And when a honeybee lands on that flower, those stamens are released and being held under tension like they are, they tend to spring forward and hit honeybees in the face. Um, consequently, honeybees quickly learn to adapt to alfalfa blossoms by nectar robbing, approaching the flower from behind and sipping nectar out of it without ever pollinating the flower, um, which is why the alfalfa leaf cutter bee and this alkali bee tend to be sort of the preferred pollinator. 
Um, there's great new research demonstrating the, the large uh, difference between foraging efficiency of honeybees and wild bees on alfalfa. Thinking about brassicas, um, pollinator attractiveness is highly variable among brassica species and among varieties. Um, of course, brassicas tend to require outcrossing. They tend to um, be highly susceptible to undesirable outcrossing. Um, and cool season uh, flowering plants tend to be a little bit trickier to get warm season bees like the alfalfa leaf cutter bee or the honey bee to forage on. Um, but with brassicas, your, your small sweat bees are oftentimes some of the most abundant and efficient pollinators, as well as small um, solitary wasps and flies. Thinking about cucurbits, I've talked about the role of squash bees and how squash bees make the pollination um, process by honeybees largely irrelevant um, or unnecessary in most parts of the country. The one exception is the area that we that I live in here in the maritime northwest. This is sort of the one pocket of North America where squash bees aren't present. But bumblebees, longhorn bees, um, sweat bees tend to be the, the primary pollinators of cucurbits. Thinking about carrots and, and carrot relatives, um, these, these plants tend to be relatively unattractive to bees generally. Some small solitary sweat bees will be common carrot um, seed crop visitors, but more frequently you see flies and you will in some cases even see these operations that use um, isolation screens to contain flies and to keep Queen Anne's lace pollen or other carrot variety pollen from um, transferring to those flowers. And flies are actually commercially available for uh, pollination. You get them as sort of dormant uh, pupa that you introduce into these screen cages. Um, thinking about beans, beans are something that we tend to um, consider to be largely self-fertile, and that is certainly the case, but bean flowers are um, attractive to a few select species of bees, especially your bumblebees and various summer active leaf cutter bees. So if you go through some of the, the later steps that I'm gonna talk about here to actually increase overall pollinator abundance on your farm, um, this could be an area that you wanna pay some attention to. If you increase pollinator abundance um, to a, a really great degree, you can expect to probably see some, some outcrossing among self-fertile crops like beans. Um, tomatoes uh, are a crop that is most commonly associated with bumblebees. Again, we consider tomatoes to be largely self-fertile, which is of course true, but tomatoes having the porisital anthers, the anthers that um, don't freely release pollen, but have to be shaken to get some of that pollen loose, sort of like shaking salt from a salt shaker. Even among self-fertile varieties, um, we see insect shaking, specifically bumblebee shaking, being really, really important to maximizing yield. Um, bumblebees have this really unique ability to grab hold of a tomato blossom. Actually, they bite a hold of it with their jaw and they vibrate their whole body. Um, and you can hear this. I'm sure many of you have seen this looking at tomato blossoms in the summer. When those bumblebees grab hold, they actually physically vibrate that flower and audibly vibrate it at um, basically the same frequency as a middle C musical note. So if any of you are musicians, you can take a middle C tuning fork out into the tomato field this summer and hold it up to a tomato flower and you'll see that little magical burst of pollen from that flower. That's what, that's what bumblebees are doing to tomatoes. Um, sunflowers are uh, fairly promiscuous in terms of their pollinator attractiveness, attracting many different species of bees, honeybees being great effective pollinators of sunflowers, but also bumblebees, various sweat bees, various longhorn bees. Um, as we see now with the, the rise of zero trans fat sunflower oil, we're seeing a greater dependence on 
uh, wild pollinators in California's Central Valley to produce those hybrid seed crops in sunflower. And then that seed is planted out in the Dakotas and that later stage, that hybrid seed is um, typically far less pollinator dependent. And many of those varieties will set seed without any pollinator visitation as well. Alliums tend to uh, sort of select the insect that, that it wants to visit them. Alliums um, as a whole have potassium and sulfur rich nectar that certain bee species uh, really don't like, honeybees being one of those groups, various sweat bees, various wasps, various flies tend to really uh, like allium nectar and tend to be very attracted to the flowers. Um, there are some issues with um, caging alliums for isolation. There are um, compatibility issues with alliums. We could probably devote an entire workshop to the intricacies of allium pollination. Um, but the, the sort of important message here from a pollinator standpoint is that um, there are those chemicals sequestered in the, the nectar that really um, dictate the types of bee visitation that you see to the plants. And then finally, corn. Um, corn, of course, when pollinated, right? Doesn't need pollinators. But in fact, pollinators visit corn. Um, honeybees and short-tongued bumblebees and that Bombus bimaculatus, that black and white longhorn bee, will actively and aggressively visit corn for um, sort of a, a cheap and easy pollen resource that they can uh, bring back. And from a nutritional standpoint, it's sort of like them feeding um, you know, high fructose corn syrup or potato chips to their young, but um, in terms of quantity, it's a pretty rewarding resource for them. So thinking about that 50 mile square area that a honeybee hive will forage over, what does that mean for isolation between organic um, seed corn crops and um, GMO or, or a, a conventional um, corn seed crop that may be nearby? Again, think about the pollinators that you're trying to support on your farm and how that functions in the surrounding landscape. Okay, I'll give you a few thoughts here on sort of farming practices to optimize pollinator abundance and pollinator diversity on your farm. Of course, with organic systems, there are some clear advantages from a pollinator conservation standpoint. There's typically greater crop diversity in organic farm systems. There's typically less, well, there's typically no herbicide use, which is important because pollinators, in addition to foraging on your crop, are also foraging on little weedy plants um, that are in the background of active crop production. And we find that herbicide use is oftentimes more of a limiting factor to pollinator abundance on farms than insecticide use, which is a little bit counterintuitive. But Having just small weedy plants um, in the edges of farm systems can make a, a really significant uh, difference in, in fostering bee abundance. Um, most organic systems, of course, are using fewer insecticides as well, which makes a difference. Most organic systems are oftentimes in a more patchwork landscape and provide more uh, pollen and nectar resources of various kinds as well, all of which makes organic systems significantly more beneficial on uh, pollinator populations. But beyond, you know, just sort of the, the broad categorization of organic systems as being beneficial, there are farm practices that have a, a impact on um, the way pollinators will use a farm or the, the levels, the population levels that they can rise to. Tillage being one of those limiting factors. So again, the majority of all bee species on earth are solitary bees. Of those solitary bees, the majority of them are ground nesting species. If that is the case, then what does cultivation do to those species? And this is a, a tricky one. Um, if you think about no-till systems, they're oftentimes chemically dependent systems. Um, and organic farmers have to oftentimes rely more extensively on cultivation 
for weed management. But think about what that does to, to your pollinator populations. Um, there are, of course, alternatives to cultivation, and there are ways to mitigate some of the impact of cultivation. Um, you've got increasingly more um, sort of organically based herbicide options. Um, we've used uh, horticultural vinegar on some of the farms where we've done conservation trials looking at um, ways to eliminate vegetation without, eliminate weeds without using conventional herbicides. I wish that I could say the, the vinegar had been um, successful in the systems we've looked at, but it largely has not, but you may get there with um, some of these other organic herbicide options. There are flame weeders, there are cover crops, smother crops. Shallow cultivation, as a general rule, is less detrimental to those ground nesting bee populations than deep subsoil cultivation. So take of that what you will. There's no right or wrong. Everything that I'm presenting here is going to be sort of a trade-off. Did you have a question? Yeah, so those bees will, in many cases, um, tunnel down several feet into the ground. Yeah, they're way down there. And even just that shallow cultivation, you're disrupting their ability to find that nest entrance or that nest exit, depending on where the bee is in its life cycle. Um, we do see with some of the small sweat bees that they, they seem to be a little bit more adaptable and able to deal with some of that, that upper level soil disturbance without totally suppressing their populations. You just did the top inch or a couple inches of soil. Yeah, they are. Yeah, so usually there'll be a single nest entrance or exit tunnel, um, sort of a vertical tunnel that branches out into different individual cells where different um, individual bees are developing within. So it looks uh, sort of like an, an upside down tree where you've got the, the main trunk going down that branches out into um, some horizontal pathways. Okay, we've got really, we've got great research um, from the past few years demonstrating that farms that have um, reduced tillage or no-till systems have significantly more ground nesting bees um, operating within those farms. It's intuitive, it makes sense. Um, we've seen this pretty consistently with squash coming out of research trials um, in the eastern U.S., um, also, beyond tillage, it's important to recognize the role of insecticides in suppressing bee populations, even organic-approved insecticides. Um, so there's a lot of controversy now around the role of neonicotinoids, these systemic conventional insecticides in, um, in bee declines in this country, and a lot of people are saying, well, you know, if we get rid of these, what are the alternatives? Are we going to something worse? And we've had sort of the organic community on the other end of the spectrum feeling more comfortable about the, the insecticide options that we have available. But um, I'm not sure that that's always the case. We've got um, various organic approved insecticides like spinosa that are deadly lethal to bees. Um, so we don't get a pass like everybody else. We need to be thinking about how you can mitigate the impact of insecticides on bees um, by selecting the products with the, the least toxicity to bees and beneficials. You can um, adopt simple best management practices like spraying at night where possible when bees aren't active, uh, by controlling your spray drift, by calibrating equipment, these basic fundamental rules of safe insecticide handling apply to organic production as much as they do to conventional production. There's a really great um, manual, How to Reduce Bee Poisoning from Pesticides, that is published by Oregon State University, Washington State University, and um, University of Idaho. And you can download this from any of those state extension service websites or from the Xerces Society website. This guide lists all major, all generally commonly used insecticides 
in the United States and their relative toxicity to not just honeybees, but also bumblebees, uh, mason bees, leafcutter bees. Um, so it's an incredibly useful resource and it has OMRI approved uh, insecticides listed in it as well. So again, um, organic approved insecticides are not necessarily safer for bees. You've got things like I still see people using rotenone um, as an insecticide in some cases. We've got spinosa, we've got bavaria, we've got our pyrethrums. These are deadly lethal to bees. Um, we've got safer options within the organic uh, realm, of course, insecticidal soaps horticultural oils, these tend to be relatively uh, relatively safe as long as you're not directly applying them where bees are present. And then, of course, there are even safer options. There are very targeted insecticides like uh, plain old powder BT for caterpillar pests. There are pheromone traps. There are mating disruption options for certain pests. There are insect repellents. I wish I could say these worked. Um, like garlic oil or citrus oil, in my experience, and your mileage may vary. Um, these haven't been particularly effective at suppressing um, a number of the pests that I've looked at. Um, but we do have these, these safer options. We, of course, have non-insecticidal tools at our disposal in certain cases, things like floating row covers, um, crop rotation, crop diversity, the breeding of resistant varieties, good sanitation, these fundamental rules of sustainable agriculture can work in our favor, um, both in terms of protecting pollinators and reducing pest damage. And then it's worth keeping in mind that all of these things, all of these steps to protect pollinators also protect all of your other beneficial insects. They protect things like the surfid fly that's laying eggs. That egg is gonna hatch and that, that surfid fly larvae is going to hunt down those aphids and eat uh, several dozen of them in a day. Um, and that surfid fly adult, when it's done laying that egg, is going to go visit a flower and pollinate it. It's a beneficial insect at every stage of its life. So thinking about pollinator conservation, you're also conserving all these beneficial insects that will contribute to pest control and reduce the need for insecticides. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about conserving habitat for bees because this is sort of the final piece of the puzzle. You think about um, having some basic knowledge of pollinator diversity and pollinator life cycles on your farms. If you have some basic knowledge of the different pollination mechanisms of your crops, if you think about the farm management piece, those are all um, important components here, but the last piece of the puzzle is actually conserving habitat for pollinators. And it should be obvious, but the amount of natural habitat on or close to a farm has a direct real-world impact on pollinator abundance and pollinator diversity. Um, this graph, the second most boring graph of the presentation and the last of the graphs, um, demonstrates why habitat matters. If you look at this, and this is not a seed crop, but this is a fruit crop, the same story, though, can be translated to any insect pollinator dependent crop system. Um, this graph represents in the vertical blue gray bar here the average uh, bloom time, the annual bloom time for low bush blueberries in eastern Canada, late May, early June. The the horizontal orange bars represent the average nesting period, the active adult flying lifespan of the bee pollinators that are specialists of that crop. If you just look at bumblebees, the, the last um, horizontal bar on this graph, you can see that the bumblebees in those blueberry barrens in eastern Canada are active from April all the way through September into early October. Unless if you're the blueberry farmer, unless you have um, wildflowers or some alternative pollen and nectar resource in bloom before and after that crop flowers, then how can you expect those bumblebees to ever sort of build up their population to the local carrying capacity um, that, that you may ultimately desire to have a reliable pollinator foundation for your farm. Bees need pollen and nectar resources throughout their lifespan. 
And in fact, when we look at farms that have an abundance of diverse pollen and nectar resources throughout the growing season, we see consistently farms that don't require bringing in bees from off the farm to, to pollinate those crops. If we look at um, the mid-Atlantic states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, where average farm sizes are less than 20 acres, those farms exist within a patchwork landscape of um, forests and abandoned pastures and active um, dairy farms and even suburban gardens. Those farms in that patchwork landscape with different pollen and nectar resources throughout the year can get all of their pollination needs met from the wild bees that are supported by that landscape alone. They don't need to bring in bees to pollinate their crops. The landscape is providing the pollination service. The same thing is true if we look at even a large scale monoculture crop. If we look at canola production in Western Canada, this is counterintuitive, so bear with me here for a moment. But in the absence of honeybees, canola growers in Western Canada make more money. This is counterintuitive. They make more money through increased seed yields if they take 30% of their farm out of production and maintain it as natural habitat. Counterintuitive, where I'm I don't know, some of you, it was before my time, but I see some of you who are here who are probably old enough to remember Earl Butts, um, Secretary of Ag under Nixon. We were supposed to do the fence row to fence row farming, maximize yields, right? Um, turns out that old Earl wasn't right about that. Um, you take 30% of your land out of production as a canola grower in the absence of honeybees, you make more money, you produce more seed. Counterintuitive. Um, what that means is that the Earl Butts farm here, the fence row to fence row farm, makes less money, has less yield than this farm, than the farm with habitat. Um, and thinking about that from just sort of an intrinsic human quality of life standpoint as well, which farm would you rather live on? Uh, same story is true if we look at uh, California's Central Valley you know, an apocalyptic agricultural landscape, if there ever was one. Um, I've been working more in India recently, which is mind-blowing from a farm system standpoint to see a combination of environmental degradation, uh, poverty, and crowding. Um, California's Central Valley is probably worse um, from what I've seen. <laughs> um, if you are a farmer in the middle of the Central Valley, if you have a typical Central Valley landscape with no habitat around you, you are pretty much dependent on bringing in truckloads of honeybees to pollinate your crop. If you get outside the Central Valley, you go up to the Cape Valley, if you live here, right, if you've got hedgerows, if you've got riparian areas, if you've got mountain foothills with some wild vegetation on them, if you've got 30% or more of the farm in, in, and the surrounding landscape within a mile or so of the farm in natural habitat, you don't need to bring in bees. The landscape provides the bees for you. If you don't live in this type of setting, then you begin to think about how you can bring some of that habitat into the farm. This is that same story. This is um, California Central Valley on the right, look at that fence row to fence row, Earl Butts farming, entirely dependent on a industrial beekeeping uh, model to pollinate those crops. You look at the Cape Valley here on the left, uh, mountain foothills, riparian areas, hedgerows, those farms get all of their pollination from the landscape. They get a lot of their pest management from the landscape as well. We consistently see that on-farm habitat, um, if you do have to create it, if you do want to go that extra step, if you create a hedgerow on your farm, looking at now a nine-year research project that the Xerces Society has been uh, partnering with um, researchers at the University of California, Berkeley on, we see that habitat, if it's restored habitat on the farm, it actually exports pollinators into the crop field. A lot of times farmers say, um, you know, especially conventional, very um, sort of set in their way, farmers will say, well, if I create that habitat, isn't it just going to concentrate all of the bees in that hedgerow or that wildflower patch that I create? In fact, that's not the case. We consistently see, looking at this, and 
you can ignore, I guess, the, the graph here on the left. But look at the one on the right. Um, the, that represents the, the abundance of pollinators in a uh, different crop system. The top bar representing the pollinator abundance on farms that have hedgerows. Uh, the, bottom the bottom bar on that graph representing the abundance of pollinators on farms that don't have hedgerows. You go out, if you put a hedgerow on a farm, a native wild shrub hedgerow in California, you can go out 50, 100, 250 meters out into the crop field on that farm that has the hedgerow, and you see that that hedgerow is exporting bees out into the crop system. It's not concentrating them. Another concern that comes up, if I create habitat on a farm, is it fostering pests? Is it creating refugia for the insects that I don't want? Um, working with, again, native shrub hedgerows in California, we see that this is not the case. Uh, we consistently see, looking here at control sites, these are, are various insect pests in typical California Central Valley crops. For those of you who can't see this in the back, um, things like aphids, cucumber beetles, the pest populations in the control sites, the farms that don't have hedgerows are represented by the clear bars, the clear vertical bars. The hedgerow sites are represented in black, the pest populations in those hedgerows. We consistently see that where hedgerows are present on farms, that those habitats are not refugia for pests. There are certain exceptions, you know, if you're living up here and you're um, growing something susceptible to spotted wing drosophila, you probably don't want to have uh, wild fruiting crops. But thinking about this from purely a seed production standpoint, um, habitat does not increase pest populations. Okay. Um, so thinking about this, you know, again, think about including diverse pollen and nectar resources, wildflowers that bloom throughout the year, throughout the spring, throughout the summer, throughout the fall. Um, you can incorporate wild flowers and flowering shrubs into things like insectary plantings or bee pastures. Having a minimum of at least three or four things blooming in each season will really um, maximize pollinator populations. In the northwest, we've got some great wildflower options. You've got things like checker mallows and lupins and self-heal and meadow foam, Douglas meadow foam or clarkia. Depending on where you live in the country, you've got a similar set of great pollinator plants. And I'll give you um, a few resources here in a moment to track down good recommended wildflower species for your farm. Um, some, some easy options here in the West Coast as well that will rapidly increase pollinator numbers, things like Phacelia, things like California poppy, blanket flower, um, again, don't worry about the specifics. I can direct you to, to some better lists here in the moment. I should point out that having come from the native seed industry myself, there's a growing market for this type of conservation plant material as well. Um, I'm going to Moses here in a few weeks, the Moses Conference, and um, doing a workshop on native seed production. If you already grow um, vegetable seeds, there are opportunities that might be worth exploring in the native wildflower and grass seed realm as well. You can all track me down later and, and talk with me more about that if you want. Um, there are shrubs that you can use to incorporate pollinator habitat into the farm, willows, Oregon grape, huckleberries and blueberries here on the west coast. But again, depending on where you live, um, you've got myriad options of of high value pollinator shrubs. You can incorporate pollinator habitat into buffer systems, into grass waterways, irrigation ditches, um, drainage basins. There are many ways that you can seed pollinator habitat into a farm without occupying active production space. You've got flowering cover crops that you can use to bring pollinator resources onto the farm as well. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here and just leave you with some final thoughts. Um, Really, the big, the big picture thought here is that we've got these really catastrophic declines taking place among our, our managed and wild pollinators right now, but there is something that every single person can do. Every single person can incorporate habitat onto a farm and reverse this trend. And even one flower is habitat. Um, and this strategy works anywhere. I work with farmers from Maine to Florida to California to India to God knows where at this point. Um, 
And we see that this strategy works anywhere. We've got blueberry farms that no longer need to bring in bees for pollination. We can create wildflower field borders like this that pollinate that crop. This strategy works anywhere. Works in apocalyptic California Central Valley landscapes, in almond orchards. Um, look at this photo here for a moment. Even if you know nothing about bees, you know that if it weren't for these wildflowers here in the foreground, that that bee would not be captured in this photo. Um, we didn't set out to take a, pic a picture of a bee in mid-flight. Um, this farm grows its own pollinators. This farm grows its own pollinators. You can incorporate native wildflower habitat into native rangeland. You can incorporate pollinator habitat into orchards, into vineyards, into any model of crop system. This farm grows its own pollinators. This blueberry farm in New England gets all of its pollination from that wildflower field border. This farm grows its own pollinators. A cranberry bog in Massachusetts took a weedy area. We replanted, we hydro seeded in this case, native wildflowers onto the weedy embankments after removing the existing invasive plants. This farm now grows its own pollinators. This works anywhere. Again, California, um, you can incorporate pollinator habitat into uh, irrigation pump stations, around wells, around field roads, places where you're not growing anything anyway. This farm grows its own pollinators. Does anybody know my buddy um, Doug and his wife, Doug and Anna Crabtree in Haver, Montana? Um, fascinating producers. We've worked with them to integrate pollinator habitat strips like this throughout their farm. Um, they're now over 1,500 acres of dry land, um, small grains and oilseed crops. This is what their farm looks like. This farm grows all of its own pollinators for safflower, sunflower, flax, and several other things. This works here in Oregon. It works in Wisconsin for imperiled pollinators like the Carner blue butterfly. We can take um, highly degraded pasture systems and create habitat and bring these animals back. And this butterfly is now going extinct rapidly. It went extinct in two states this past year and Wisconsin is its last stronghold. And this is what is going to keep this butterfly alive. Um, works anywhere. Even temporary wildflower strips that get plowed under after a single season this farm in California Central Valley grows its own pollinators, even though it's in a landscape that doesn't have those mountain foothills or those riparian areas or hedgerows. So to wrap up, um, give you a few thoughts. Please connect with your local USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service if you're looking for financial or technical assistance for pollinator conservation. My organization, uh, the Xerces Society is subcontracted by the, the USDA NRCS. We're sort of the pollinator technical branch of the agency. Um, but please connect with them. They've got some great incentive programs to offset the costs of creating pollinator habitat on your farm. Um, and you can work with the NRCS to contract me and my team to come out to your farm and actually develop a custom pollinator conservation blueprint for you called the Pollinator conservation activity plan. There are a bunch of free publications on our website that I encourage you to check out at xerces.org, xerces.org. Among these are this new guide, Pollinator Management for Organic Seed Producers. I have some copies of this for sale. If you're interested in this, contact me um, after I get off the stage here. This is basically this talk, but in much more depth in book form. Um, so track me down if you're interested in that. It's also available for download from our website. Um, our magnum opus, Attracting Native Pollinators, Lane says she has this book. Is it worth the money? Okay. Um, this has everything you want to know about pollinators. It's almost like 400 pages of basic bee ecology, butterfly ecology, conservation guidelines for farms, natural areas, school gardens, parks, you name it. It's all in this book. The first ever field ID guide to common native bee groups of North America. Uh, extensive plant appendices for finding the right conservation plants for your area. I've got some of these with me today as well. Um, 
This summer, we've got its companion book coming out, Farming with Native Beneficial Insects. This book is going to be about 300 pages of information on how to manipulate habitat on your farm to reduce pest populations and increase populations of the insects that feed upon those pests. So watch for this. Um, our Pollinator Conservation Resource Center is on our website. This is a great go-to source for uh, local native plant nurseries that sell pollinator-attractive plants as well as pesticide guidelines and so on. Okay, take-home message. Um, I've just talked about pollinators here for an hour and a half as though this is like the latest and greatest thing, but in fact, pollinator conservation is a really old concept. It's something that was common sense to people of my grandparents and great-grandparents' generation um, who had the forethought to create, I don't know what you'd call this, a small fact sheet for lack of a better term, that makes the bold proclamation that wild bees are good pollinators. Who would have thought that? That you can conserve hedgerows or woodlots or field borders for bumblebees that will go out and pollinate your red clover crop and that you can harvest that seed and make some money off it. Look at the date on the bottom of this. Um, June 1950, uh, developed by the Soil Conservation Service now, the USDA Natural Resources Con Conservation Service. This stuff is common sense. Last thing. Um, Again, what's old is new. This is not a, a new concept. In 1938, Dr. Edith Patch, the first female president of the United uh, of the Entomological Society of the United States, came up with this really amazing prediction that by the year 2000, the president of the U.S. would issue a proclamation claiming that land areas at regular intervals across the country would be maintained as insect gardens under the direction of government entomologists, and that these would be maintained with milkweed and hawthorn and other plants that could sustain populations of wild bees um, and butterflies. And she predicted that at some point in the future, entomologists would be as much or more concerned with the preservation of beneficial insect life as they are now with the destruction of injurious insects. I don't know that this has come true. Entomologists still seem to be largely um, involved in the destruction of life. Um, but in another way, I think this is coming true, and I think it's coming true through the efforts of people like you who are willing to put up with me for an hour and a half talk about how you can bring pollinators back to your farm and how we can reverse these long-term declines that we're seeing in our bees. So thank you so much.